Okay, we're recording. Welcome everyone to the Flux Dev meeting for September 5th, 2024. Uh, let's get started. Is there anyone whose agenda item needs to go first or should we proceed in order? Sunny? Uh, I would like to discuss other things because I have a lot of things and it may take over the whole meeting. <laughs> Is there anything else we, can, we need to discuss? Actually, if that's the case, mine's just a quick shout out. Um, uh, so the lots of KubeCon deadlines were last week. And just, I just want to do a shout out to um, um, Pinky and Lee. Uh, we got together our videos for the keynote uh, that we do every year. Thanks also to Stefan for pointing us in the right direction of the topics that we could include in I think we only get 60 seconds, but we crammed it in there. And uh, so we'll probably end up doing more working with the videographer in the coming weeks to edit and clean up the, the final recording. But um, <laughs> Lee had uh, COVID and Pinky was also sick. So I really appreciate that they helped do the recordings uh, last week, even though they're quite sick. So that's just my check-in. Otherwise, yes. Um, stupid stuff regarding the booth, but we're waiting to get confirmation that we'll have the booth in Salt Lake City because we're all com committed to be there. So that's all my check-in. Hey, Stefan. Oh, had the, hey, it all. So Ooh, your, the beard, your beard's getting a, <laughs> a little gray there. <laughs> yeah, um, my hair, my beard, everything, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, we did the keynote video, or at least we put the pieces, and now the video editor will edit together into a final thing. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just very hard because it's, it's barely September, and the keynote's not until November, so... Um, but yeah, so thanks to Pinky and um, uh, Lee for putting together the bits for that. Uh, did you mention the bucket API going GA? Uh, next um, week, I think that was the... Yeah, I can look at the slides. Uh, I just sort of did the intro, really basic a few seconds of what is Flux, and then they covered that, and I was juggling a few things, so I wasn't deep in the bits, but I can go look at the slides. And, and yeah, we no, might still, I shouldn't say this in the recording, but we might still have time to fix things if it if somehow is missing, because um, the editor uh, was on vacation anyway, and obviously has to edit all the videos. So yeah, okay. Thanks so much. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. That's all. OK, Sunny. Um, one more thing, I see Louis is here. He came last week regarding some flagration. Uh, Louis, can yes. you talk about Yes, it? I, yeah, thank you. Um, this was a flagger issue specific to Istio routing uh, when we're trying to do A-B testing. Um, we found that currently when you set a match rule um, on, on your Canary custom resource, uh, the match rules get set, but then basically it adds both uh, destinations, both the primary and the canary destination on the same uh, route that has the match rules. So essentially, even if you set match rules, traffic still gets routed to both of the deployments. So so we open up a PR um, that I think, uh, Sunny, you added it to the meeting notes uh, to, yeah. to address that issue. So just wanted to do a quick follow up on that. Yeah, let me look a second on the pull request. Yeah, I added a description to Stefan. So, you know, basically on the top, you're going to see what uh, Flagger generates right now. Um, it's part of the virtual service route. And then on the bottom, uh, what the PR will generate. Um, one thing too that I that I uh, saw in the ECT documentation too is that if you only have one destination on a route, um, it's just gonna default one hundred percent of the traffic to that destination. So basically, putting the weight uh, in 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 there is is basically unnecessary. So we could, we could remove that too, but you know it's, it it works as expected, right? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. 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 
how is the weight 50 percent how did you get to this value are you mixing a b testing with routing yeah so basically i think um the, the the main issue is not necessarily the the weights themselves um or are you saying if, if we set the weight to 100 percent, then it should just essentially route everything to the canary and then shift everything over to primary oh i mean in your canary definition do you have any weights that up yes um i i did set the the weight progression to 50 percent and then uh all the way up to 100 right after that um so that's that's how that's getting set right okay but that's not a b testing so in that case should we just set 100 as the way to the canary don't set it like in the docs at all Got it. So if we do that, then it should, um, because yeah, I, yeah I, I think where, where I found it confusing is that on the destination, it puts both the primary and the canary. Um, so you're saying that if I don't put the weight, then, then that should, shouldn't be an issue anymore. Yeah. The reason okay. it, it puts the mm -hmm. weights in is for, because it, at the promotion, it needs to flip all the traffic to the canary, run the rollout of the primary and then switch back. So you need those routes in place mm -hmm, for the mm -hmm. final promotion to happen. If you remove them, then everything is broken. Like your PR basically breaks, breaks the mm -hmm. a safe return of the primary. But you Got shouldn't it. be mm -hmm. you shouldn't be mixing Canary deployments with A/B testing, like in the documentation that you linked. Uh, in the analysis part, there is no there is iteration and match. Mm -hmm. There is no um, no routing setting. If you do routing setting, then you mm -hmm. you tell Flagger yes, do A/B test, but also mm -hmm. uh, progressively shift traffic, and that's why. It does what it does, and oh, that, that's, some that people want sense. that. Some mm -hmm, people mm -hmm. want that, but for front end apps, when you mm -hmm. uh, you you want to route all the people with a particular cookie, all of them to the canary, it doesn't make sense mm -hmm. to add any kind of of mm -hmm. weight, step weight, max weight. Those those things have to be removed from the from the definition. Okay, that makes complete sense. Um, thank you so much, uh, Stefan. Appreciate that. So, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll close the PR then. Cool. Yeah, T test it out without uh with with, with so you mm -hmm. delete those from the canary, and you will see that mm -hmm. the generated uh the generated mm -hmm. routes are always one hundred percent uh on 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 the canary, and everything that has that mm -hmm. header one hundred percent goes to the canary, right. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um. Yeah. Thank you so much. Welcome. Okay, son. Let's get started with your uh, topics. So you muted. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to categorize the things. Uh, things related to Git and things related to proxy. Maybe proxy is not, I think we can do proxy later. Let's talk about Git. So the Git integration tests are ready. I've ensured that it works properly and it doesn't interfere with GCP or other infrastructure. Those tests continue to work fine. And we have all the documentation or instructions needed to tell people how to enable it in your Azure DevOps account. There is some you have to link directly with your Azure DevOps account or organization. So there is some extra steps we need to document those things. Uh, so test PRs, I, I believe it's ready, but it depends on the other PR, the go get change. Uh, go get change. I, I was reviewing it, but I found that cache is 
the way we use cash is not clear yet. And uh, I have two issues with cash. One is I've already expressed about the API that we do things in our cash, but I can discuss about that later. But the other issue is how we use the cash. Uh, we don't have any well discussed or documented way of this is how we use the cache. This this would be the key in this case, and all the multi tenancy concerns. We we have started a discussion in the request thread. I also asked Polo about what we are doing, and he gave some feedback. Listen to him. It felt like he was looking for some RFC kind of thing for cash. He says it's it's like a big architecture change in across Flux. So it would be good to see documented how Flux uh, cash would be used across Flux. And maybe during that process, we can figure out details of how it's used to where, in what way. And he was also concerned about abuse of cash. We we have written code in such a way that cash cannot be used with that TV function, but there is a degradation of the service. Somebody can try to create a lot of items depending on how we configure the cache and make the cache full, if not store anything else. And depending on, on the cache we're using, it may behave differently. We have not discussed how, which type of cache should be used. Should it be eviction, time-based eviction cache or expiring cache? Or should we use the these recently used cache? And when do we use? All of these things where depends on the use case. If in some environments, maybe somebody needs LRU cache, others need expiration cache. We have not discussed any of these details. We did. And, uh, is it documented anywhere? Maybe I have missed all of those discussions. Yeah, we discuss it in the in meetings and on that pull request that uh, Sole did. So the expiry cache is used for tokens, which by nature they expire. That's why they are ephemeral tokens. And uh, the other cache, we, uh, we use it for things like uh, Helm index and uh, Hopefully, at some point, we get rid of, of BoldDB and we also use it for um, um, image tags. But did we, like, what's the reasoning behind it? Can't we use the token, the LRU cache for token storage? If there is a need for a user, uh, they want to uh, remove the, the least recently used one. They don't want the cache to get populated completely and not be used. What? I didn't understand. If there is an environment of with multi tenancy, every like your customers can have can create a lot of cache. Maybe they are cheating the secret in case of it's a GitHub or GitLab. They're creating multiple secrets, and each of these will be added in the cache. Depends on the cache expiry time, maybe it's one hour. And within short period of time, the user created multiple cache and the cache gets filled. So the administrator may want to change the cache to LRU cache. What secret? Tokens. Odd tokens. This is thinking from the Attacker's perspective is somebody tries to abuse the cache. How do we handle it? We provide some tooling to the administrator that they can change this configuration and then take care of the set issues. Are we talking about the Azure PR or something else? I'm completely In confused. general, cache, it's not exact, not related to directly Azure. General cache usage, because it was taken out of the RFC. And I, it feels like because it was taken out of the RFC, 
we didn't get any chance to think about it could be used across bus. So when you use workload identity, you cache by the URL or the uh, unique ID of the object, right? That's the current conclusion. But Paolo suggested some optimizations on top of that. I think you commented about that clarification what he said. Uh, should I explain more? Yeah, what he said makes no sense to me. Uh, you don't have multiple identities. You have only one because that's no. how Kubernetes workload identity works. He's, so, he's referring to the GitHub GitHub thing, the OAuth part, not the workload identity part. Where you have multi tenancy use case. And when he says identity, he's referring to a secret which contains the identity. This is per object based identity. Wait, but that pull the pull current pull request around Azure does not it's not deal with that, related right? to Azure, but it's generally related to caching in flux. I would say Azure DevOps uh, pull request doesn't even depend on cache. You can please it without the cache. It would be like OCA. So it's just cache related discussion. I'm looking at the Cache, git go git cache, right? And it has a key string here, right? So it's up to the, we need to expose this key to the consumers. Okay. And once Thanks. we do that, we can decide in source control when we implement GitHub and GitLab or EDC, how we compose the key. Maybe, I'm, I'm just saying maybe we need an RFC for the cache. Right now we don't have visibility about how this will be used in different places. There is Git cache, there's Hell cache. And maybe customization will have its own. Image reflector has its own. And we don't, we have not discussed anything about each of these use cases. I'm afraid that if we just release it, there may be some weirdness in our the way we expose it. There may be some conflicts. We'll find out after a few months it doesn't match with how we wanted to do it. But this is not exposed anywhere, right? You will provide cache control through the uh, the binary APIs, flags. You'll provide what? You provide control of the cache through binary flags. You would say TTL or whatever, which type of cache you want to use, size of the cache. So Stefan, did you get a chance to see the source controller PR where like the cache was getting used? So like to expose some of the properties like the size of the cache, the interval, these are all flags uh, on source controller. Um, I can share the PR if... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, seen, I've seen that. Um... Yeah, they are copy pasted from Helm, right? Helm, yeah, it's similar to the Helm one, yeah. Yeah, so what is the issue with this flex? Why would this flex it... need to be changed later on? I don't understand. I'm Any gonna... cache has two properties, the size of the cache and when you purchase it, right? That's how everything works, even no, if it's internal, is... external, whatever. That is, we are just copying it from Stellanus. I'm talking about... We don't have visibility or understanding of how we'll use cache across flux. And we are just trying to put it 
for just one specific use case without discussing all the overall thing. RFC process. I think we need to discuss it through an RFC. It need not block Azure DevOps. It can continue functioning without a cache. Will it? Why not? Why do you need because that? you'll get you'll get rate limited and you'll not be able to do anything. That's the same case with OCI. You'll get rate limited. Yeah. But people are and still this will be this will be even worse. I mean for for Asia Cam as people have been complaining that they hit the limit. Um these are two different problems. Git authentication and caching is separate. You can handle this issue by increasing your interval, reconciliation interval. It's okay for me. That's what people have been doing. <clears throat> Bootstrap does not allow it to do that. It's one minute. Because we assume Git is not rate really limited. And that's again yeah. just one specific case, right? But generally, when you create your own objects, you can change it to whatever. Mm -hmm. I just feel like uh, I feel like we need a RFC defining everything about cache. And who uh, I feel we can together do it. The things I know about, I get documented. The things you know about, the things that I have missed in meetings, I add those things. It's like for us, maintainers, it's no other outside contributors because we are we see the need, we need to add it. Or it could just be a kind of a documentation RFC. I think we had similar RFCs for some security related things. Can can we do multi tenancy with Azure? That's impossible, right? Workload identity I'm... by its definition, you cannot. Mm -hmm. There's a single identity for the entire. Yeah, I mean, uh, usually workload identity is like single tenant, but there are ways to like the way it works is you can like create a service account token right and exchange it for the actual access token temporary access token that workload identity gives you by just calling the internal endpoint so you can like with with more with an additional api and more code you can make it multi tenant by creating this token and exchanging it, the service account token. Yeah, we basically need the service account name on the mm -hmm. Git repo. Yeah, then you look up that service account and you get the, the identity from the annotation then each cloud has its own annotation, right? And what kind of identity is there? So in Amazon, it's a role. In GCP, it's a service account, etc. I was thinking about this. I, I have a feeling that it's kind of different because workload identity, in case of workload identity, you annotate the pod and some external entity injects the credential into the pod environment. Mm, the... No, 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 no. Actually, that that it's not how it works. Like you, like at well, at least I um, I I know a lot of how it works at in Google and like in our code has that right. Like in the in the pull request um for image reflector controller right that we discussed. You you pointed me the code for OCI authentication. And we hard like we implemented something that is already by default like in the in the Google libraries. There's no uh, problem with that. But that's exactly the, the endpoint that we call, right? In OCI OCI alf uh for Google, like we call this HTTP 
colon slash slash um, metadata.google.internal slash something, something, something serves account token, right? That gives you the OAuth 2.0 access token that you can directly use in the Google APIs to make API calls to GCP. Mm -hmm. And in so you don't like the pod doesn't need to have a service account token mounted into it. It just has to call this endpoint because this endpoint is 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 listed like there's something on the same VM on the same Kubernetes node listening for this endpoint, and it, it gives you the act the Google Access token directly. So the the Kubernetes service account token is like abstracted away for you when you're using workload identity, right? You don't have to mount this. Kubernetes search account token on the pod. Like the in the GKE metadata server that runs in, in GKE clusters probably has permission to create search account tokens for all search accounts in the cluster. And it does that on your behalf. But yeah, I also something in Azure it's different. At least mm -hmm. what I noticed. We pod had all the tenant and client environment mm -hmm. behavior set. So I think there are two actually webhook. Uh, pods that are running in each cluster, which mm. kind of look for these uh, annotations on the service account. And if that annotation is present, then that webhook pod is responsible for... Uh, so it's a mutating webhook? Uh, it is a mutating webhook and it kind of modifies the... Mm. Uh, the pod and the mounts pod the... Mounts the... Like loads or, or sets up the environment variables and mounts the... Uh, like the federated... Oh, got it, got it. Uh, so it mounts, mounts the service account token in environment variables and Everything. okay mm -hmm. and that works cool yeah that makes sense cool so i mean yeah, I... So, for, uh, so the conclusion is we can do it for google and uh aws because also aws works like the workload identity documentation is written like you there is no mounting things inside the pod is the EC2 metadata which you can call directly from your app and it will give you the token. So we can I'm do it sure for AWS. I'm not sure if AWS works that way. I don't know, need to check. It's possible that they also do injecting. Because but we so ask people to restart. Uh, that that was the case with uh, um, IRSA. I, uh, IRSA? Yeah, but that's gone now. Like, they actually implemented workload identity, like, no longer mounting stuff inside pods. But I you guess mean, you can, like, you, you can yeah. probably, like, in the end, all of them probably work the same way. Even if you're mounting something in the pod, like the service account token and some environment variables, in the end, you're probably exchanging this OIDC token from the service account to another one that the cloud API accepts. And that one is also temporary. So, like, let's say you can implement, um, like, the way I implemented this this project called GKE metadata server, just like in GKE, is that I have the uh I like I create a token and I also write in, in a file in memory uh configuration, JSON configuration that is like the Google credentials format configuration JSON file. And um I exchange the token, I get the token and, and send it back. Like you can probably do the same. Like it's more code, it's more complex, but you can probably like do the same for all the, I, I'm pretty sure you can probably do the same for all the other clouds and exchange, like I'm, I'm pretty certain that all the clouds will have some kind of temporary token that is not the actual OIDC token from the service account. Could it be that this is because Google runs the metadata server on the same node on each of the nodes? But but yeah, yeah, but that's only for the GKE cluster, right? Like in G GKE clusters, you have the this GKE metadata server running on every node in the cluster. The traffic mm -hmm. between the pod and that that server is like that never leaves the node. That's why it's HTTP and not HTTPS. But um, you when for example, workload identity works with any Kubernetes cluster. It doesn't have to be JK, and it's the same way that we just discussed that that the way it works for Azure. So like you you like the the documentation from Google for workload identity in a cluster that is not JKE will also like um, 
mount a service account token in the pod using the projection API. And uh, it will also have some environment variables. So it works very similar. And, and the project I did that is just like the GK metadata server that that exists only inside GK clusters is abstracting away all, all, all of that work into a central server that does the, the biggest part, you know, and exchanges for the, the temporary token. So I guess everything works actually the same way. It's like, it's actually the OIDC protocol, right? It just because you know how, how things actually work in in um the managed clusters of the clouds is might be different. In the end, you're just exchanging an OIDC token from a Kubernetes service account for another one. I'm pretty sure. I, I have to do more research to, to confirm that, but I'm pretty sure that it's possible to do. I think that's the correct. But for there, all is, the clouds. there is an identity provider element, right? I have a feeling that in case of GK, each of those nodes are identity providers, and they tell GK control plane that this is the, ident the uh, actual identified entity. And maybe in case of others, it's different. It's, uh, Can you repeat that all the nodes are what? So when we do work with an entity through GitHub, let's say, you you register GitHub as an entity provider in your cloud account, and mm -hmm. your GitHub action or whatever is trying to get that entity goes through GitHub, and GitHub tells your cloud provider this is a trusted identity. In this yeah, case, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so GitHub issues an OIDC token for your GitHub action, right? And uh, there's, for example, like all the clouds. Uh, we cloud provider have an action for log logging in using that token, right? Mm -hmm. And it's it's the same as hey hey cloud API. Here's my OIDC token. Give me another token for talking to your APIs. It's the same SDS way. Token. Yeah, yeah. This yes, that's the endpoint. That guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, need to investigate further. See how I mean, I'm I'm mostly in, I'm most interested in this topic. So if you guys <laughs> allow me a, one more week, I can check all the other cloud providers. But I, I that's something I wanted to propose for a while. Like I wanted us to have like external secrets operator has that right, like multi tenant um, automatic authentication, like with OIDC. So I want I yep. I wish we we had that in the long term. Yeah, I've seen that they they actually managed to get this uh, working. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's not tied to the pod of the, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. secrets operator. is attached to the account, which is specified in the custom resource, which that's exactly. truly multi-tenant. Um, yep. Okay, let's let's stop the discussion around multi-tenant here uh, because it's not relevant. Um, is basically we can't ship any kind of multi-tenancy to Azure DevOps. We can't ship caching because Sunny thinks it's not a good idea. So the conclusion is what? We um do we put a stop to the Azure stuff for flux no, no, 2.4? No. I or... think we should go ahead without cache. Without everything cache. Everything is ready. Everything is ready working. Just without cache. Yeah, I mean. Even from my side, I'd be like to at least uh, put the initial uh, like Azure OIDC stuff that is working uh, out. If we have some uh, un unanswered questions with respect to cache, then we can take that in the next release. But at least because yeah, I think it's been ready for a while now. <laughs> I think I've incorporated all the feedback from folks and the end to end, uh, at least the Azure OIDC part has been working. So. Okay. What? So remove the all the things around caching in the git client and all the flags from the from source control and then we do a final review. Are you okay with this, Sunny? I can do the final research and the RFC or a document explaining. Cash. We do that. 
usage of cash across different components and parts. How we yeah, expose then, the I, controls. I have no time for that this month. Maybe next no, month. It may not be this month. It can take time. There's no hurry for that. It's fine. We can yeah. do that. Yeah. It's okay. Uh, so, so, hmm? mm -hmm. so from That's my really side. Yeah, but like from my side, so I should uh, get rid of all the caching related ones and just send out a PR with just the basic Azure OIDC for source controller and for um, the package repos, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, Stefan, I wanted to confirm by what uh, date does this absolutely need to go in for, you know, be, uh, to be ready for the September release? I know, as soon as possible. <laughs> yep. Like what you still need to do in your pull request for source controller is having docs for this. Okay. Um... So you need to document the provider in the API docs. Right. You can look uh, how we did it for uh, OCI repository. So this is just a manual, like a doc change uh, indicating uh, how to use the provider, how to specify it, because I had used one of the make flags and that had generated yeah, the uh, source.md. Yeah, that's, that's the generated part, but that's mm -hmm. not for humans, uh, in my opinion. We need to write documentation for humans and um, OCA repository has nice Azure specific docs. Yeah. You can refer to that. Okay, so just like kind of general usage of workload identity, um, how to set things up, how to kind of, if a person mm -hmm. had to actually use the Azure provider, how to do that in the source. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's a user I, gave, I gave you a link. Uh, so we need this section called provider in the docs where you Today is port adoption generic Azure. You have the Azure section as in the OCI docs is mostly copy paste on here. Um, and then- Yeah, I remember for customized control also, we had something similar to remove like the workload identity, yeah. the previous identity yeah. stuff. Okay, so just to kind of end-to-end -end use it for an end user guidance for that, right? No, it's a API doc. You, you okay. document the field of this, you added a new field, right? Provider with provider. two options. Mm -hmm. So you need to document provider, you need to document what the generic option means, what the Azure option means. Mm -hmm. Then for the end-to-end -end thing, you need to modify web the website. It's in website under okay. installation, configuration, Oh, bootstrap Azure DevOps, right? So it's this one and here is the end-to-end -end thing where, so right now we have the DevOps path option, personal access token, SSH key, and here you need to add a new section how you install Flux on Azure DevOps using OEDC. I see. Okay, so the, mm -hmm. yep. Also, so would, this to... need, would, these, would this need changes to like any of these commands? Like uh, is the Git repository spec uh, something that is internally generated when we bootstrap or uh, is it, uh, like the, the user writes the Git repository spec with the provider field, like just for trying to understand if there'll be more changes needed in the bootstrap workflow itself, or uh, is it an end user facing change to modify the Git repository spec to include the provider? There are lots of changes. How would, how can bootstrap access the repo to push the flux? things. So you need to, I don't know, spin up a VM in Azure. 
bind it to the, an identity that can write the repo and then have Flux bootstrap aware of that identity, impersonate the identity. It's a lot of work. It's like bootstrap mm -hmm. does not do OEDC. Mm -hmm. So is that so, something that is dependent on like the original? <laughs> so like all of does all of this need to go in before the like as soon as possible, like before the September release, even the bootstrap related changes? I mean, no, but how would people use it? Like mm -hmm. how how are you going to boot how are you going to use Flux if bootstrap does not support it? Existing users can use it, right? Can we not start from scratch? You what? You are interrupted. I oh, so existing it. users can use it. The people who already have the setup in Azure, they can use it. But people who are starting from scratch, they cannot do it. What do you mean? <laughs> existing Azure users have some mechanism of bootstrapping and using Flux in their account. Right. Yeah. So they would just replace their not the main bootstrap repository, but other repository, other Git repositories to use on IDC. They're just trying now. In the future, when we support it in bootstrap, it will be like uh, first set call, uh, first class That's support. Part. It's like phase releases. You're enabling some feature, then you would add more other good to have abilities yeah. wait but if you have done it with bootstrap and you have ssh everywhere then we have to write a migration guy how would people know how to do it how are they going to upgrade flux because we tell people rerun so flux it's, bootstrap. it's not like from today you will use this gradually you can move to this and say if you want if you're happy with ssh keys fine, but if you want to move to OIDC to remove those old skills, extra work of maintaining those things, this is easier. You have an option. It, it's yeah, not like- I'm guessing, my, my guess is we are, really, we are going to release it. No one will use it because our tooling does not support it, but I'm not against releasing it. We can, no one will use it, I'm telling you. It's like no That's one okay. will break their whole like people have, they run Flux bootstrap in their uh, DevOps pipelines to upgrade Flux. Once you do some manual changes and you hack the SSH out and you modify the uh, GOTK sync file, the moment you want to upgrade Flux, the the boot, boot, the CLI will override that will, and everything will break, right? So unless we actually tell people how to do all these things and we have support for tooling, I don't think anyone will use it. But yeah, we can. I think that's okay. Release it in source controller. I'm not. Uh, I'm not against it. Yeah. If it's done in time, we can do it. If not, in the winter. I think it will require <laughs> more thinking about how we can, how a user will use it. It's not something. Can do it really quickly to go through the whole use case. So it'll take time, I think. And I think it's okay. Just it's just an open source project, not a company based product. We can do small changes. Okay, so with, for oh. this re this release, I'm going to try to at least wrap up the package PRs and the source controller PRs without caching and add the documentation that we spoke about for the provider and the end-to-end -end, uh, usage talks using workload identity. Oh. Or if that includes the bootstrap one, then I'll, I'll try, but at least I'll try th these uh, going and then uh, next phase would be the bootstrap. Does that sound good? Yep. Okay, you, thank you. You can also, it will be a small thing, I think you can add the, the provider flag in the CLI and create the Git repository object. I think it would be a small thing, but maybe not even required. 
Okay, yeah, I, I'll I'll I'll, I'll complete all of these first, and then I'll check out the CLI change because I'm not familiar with that portion at all. So I don't want mm-hmm. to kind of get into that and then miss you know completing all of these other peers. So that's okay. Uh, another Thank related you. topic to this: Are we okay with releasing this only in Git repository and not in image information, or are we waiting for image information as well? So I have those changes ready. Like, I mean, I have made the changes, like I was just waiting on getting this feedback, but I can uh, do one final round of testing on that because it's a small change there as well. But obviously it depends on the source controller changes going in for the API. And then, uh, yeah, I have to do that. But yeah, I would just yeah, would love thoughts on what is the prioritization there. Yeah, image automation should definitely support it if we do it in source controller. Um, is it uses the same package, right? So it should be straightforward. Yep. Okay, no caching there as well. So just the simple change to kind of use the auth ops and pass the yeah. provider. Yeah, I mean, image automation controller has a reference to the Git repo object. You fetch the repo object, and if provider Azure is there, you have the same checkout push. I mean, all the Git operations should use the OEDC authentication that we already have in the client. So just initializing the client auth with the provider should be enough. Uh, hopefully, I'm not sure, but we we'll have to see. Okay. Oh, so for uh, uh, one more question. Uh, for the for the new PRs that uh, for like the modified PR, should I can I just create a new PR targeting the main branch rather than the Fluxish or OIDC, removing all the caching and just having the base uh, provider stuff. I did not want to lose the history of all the code that we have uh, for the caching as well. That was another reason. I guess not. Caching code is not much. Or nothing, I would say. <laughs> just wants a few functions. Okay. So That's just okay. okay, modify the existing ones and uh, still target the the like the other branch, the flux. I, I was I was thinking, what's the point of pointing the git changes to a separate branch, you can just merge it in main, but the test uh, pull request, that can be merged to a separate branch so that you can run every all the CI jobs and verify everything is working fine before adding it to the main branch. That, that, was, that was the whole idea, right? We have the Azure Keto ETC branch where we have two pull requests for integration tests and the actual code. We merge them, we run the test there. And if that breaks, we can still patch them if they are not in main. And finally, we promote them from this branch to main when the test passed. We already discussed this, right? But, but the main change, the go get change, need not be in that other branch. It can just go to the main directly. We was the point of it then? There's no point. There is a safety in case of tests. So if we don't break the tests in main, the integration tests, it's not like we will make any change after that in that branch to the Google chain. Cool. And the way it is, I can say, Everything can go to me because I have tested everything. It works, yes, it works. Okay, so you go and change the branches. It's simple. The target the, of the pull request. Uh, the Azure part, we don't have Azure in CI. So it doesn't even matter. Do not exercise oh, right, right, it. Right. it on our account. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, so you can change the target branch in the existing uh, pull requests. Okay, just target main then. 
for uh, the go get ones the, like the get ones only or also the azure get ids like the integration tests uh, remain to, to the uh, separate branch no 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 it can just also be too. both of them okay that's so okay okay sounds good thank you uh do we have extra time <laughs> all of you or some of you to discuss more things actually i have to drop in four minutes can <laughs> i give my updates Real quick, okay. I have a call, an important call. Okay, okay. Um, real quick, um, so I didn't actually make much progress on the issue with notification controller about the connectors from MS Teams going away. And so we need that new payload format, right? Called adaptive card. Uh, my progress there this week was just that I took, like I, I looked at some examples. There's a website with a lot of examples. So I basically think I I can like file a PR and 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 ship that preview build with the workflow that we have for building that in notification controller and post in the thread and ask the people using MS Teams to test that. On another um, note, I also have been following up with um, Deepti. Actually, I think you maybe could help with that. I'm, I don't know, uh, but um, so I'm I'm. I'm trying to sign up for MS Teams for Microsoft 365 so I can test the feature, but I'm having a lot of problems to just um, sign up for this, for like the trial of a Microsoft 365 business basic plan that would allow me to have MS Teams with the Power Automate workflows that what that's what allows the adaptive car payload. And um, it just doesn't work. Like I, I, I have a long thread with the technical support helping me to, to sign up for this product. Also, they involved somebody from sales that is supposed to give me a purchase link and everything, but that, that's kind of going slowly. So I was, I was wondering if you have an MS Teams environment where we can test this feature, Deepti, could you maybe help with that? Uh, <laughs> I have like Microsoft Teams that I work on a, like, like, a regular just like we have slack right some something like that but in a test environment i'll have to check how we kind of set that up i can check and get back uh yeah i mean like maybe like if you could maybe uh, have um um i don't know i think that like just having a, a cluster in kind locally should work with this and if you have the environment maybe you could test yourself you could help us with that is that possible if you have the environment rather than give me access or something like that <laughs> or uh, i don't know yeah i don't even know how the access works because i think it's kind of closed within microsoft right so it would be like uh, uh yeah, our, right. the, the, the tenant here uh what exactly is are we testing it's basically like a provider for notification controller so uh channel where notification controller can forward flux events to you know, like like a Slack message, but in this case, MS mm -hmm. Teams message. I see. Mm -hmm. So the the background for this is that if we don't fix it in the next week, we Flux will no longer work with MS Teams mm -hmm. notification, and a bunch of Azure users rely on Microsoft Teams to look and see when something fails in Flux, this is how they do their SRE on call and so on. If we are okay to say, sorry, if Microsoft has deprecated this, we can't help you. It's okay. I mean, I I don't care about Microsoft Teams at all. We can just remove it from Flux and that's it. Uh, if we don't have anyone that can help us test it, it's uh, mm -hmm. I'm okay with it. The idea is at 1st of October, Microsoft will cut off the APIs that we use. So everybody that relies on Microsoft Teams, it's, they are done. Um, I, I gave you the issue like a mm -hmm. yeah, months I th ago. <laughs> I think I remember. No, I think the um, they had changed the way uh, the uh, payload is sent or something to MS Teams. Uh, yeah. Mm. So from my side for testing, what exactly would we need? Like, do you, we have some sort of code changes already? And we want to Not really, but I can get those out really quick, like today, 
And uh, what we need is an environment with MS Teams that, um, like, I, I do have MS Teams, but it, I my, my MS Teams is like a personal account thing. So I don't have access to the features that are important for testing this. And it's like something called workload, uh, workflows. And it, it integrates with um, this thing called Power Automate, where you can, I guess you can like build lots of different workflows there. But one simple thing that you can do there is to create this incoming webhook, which is like uh, the same feature that we are using right now for the MS Teams provider, right? We have a, it's a, an incoming webhook. So our payload go into this incoming webhook feature from MS Teams that is going to be deprecated. So it's something along those lines. So, you know, just um, if you have an MS Teams that you can click, I mean, I can send you the links, but um, if you have an MS Teams where you can make workflows, that would, that's what would, we would need for testing this. Okay, let me check. I'm not super familiar with any of these terminologies, but I can check in. Are you in Slack in CNCF? Mm -hmm. uh, I am, yeah. We can chat there if it's okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. Also, I think I'm going to give uh, another update um, about the, in the chat, I have to drop now, but it's about the uh, image reflector controller pull request for proxy. Uh, just a minor implementation detail in the package repo, Sunny, about where exactly to pass the proxy option because there's the constructor of the manager and there's also mm -hmm. some provider options the option. in the login method, right? So I wasn't sure where exactly to pass I them. I thought about but it. We I, can... I think oh, it should be the manager. You did? In the pull request? That's what uh, that's what I wrote there, but we can discuss oh. later. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, yeah. Like I saw your suggestion with proxy in the constructor of the manager, but I, I think that uh, that doesn't make sense. Uh, uh, like I think it's maybe it makes more sense in the other. But I mean, I just we need to think more about that. I guess. Uh, so I will start a thread in the Flux Maintainers channel. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Cool. Um. The, Stefan, what's the, our priority for shipping these things? Like, um, no, okay, you already gave me an update about the M the micro MS Teams thing, but what about these uh, proxy support for our image reflector controller? Um, is that something that really needs to be? Yeah, in yeah, I think we, we we should definitely get it in because we we added. I mean, currently proxy support is broken, as Sunny has discovered. The thing that we work is source controller. <laughs> it doesn't work for uh, OEDC authentication, right? I would not say it's broken. We are introducing proxy support in this release, but it's not 100%. If people are not using OIDC, it will work through proxy. But if they are using OIDC, those connections will not go to it. Yeah, I mean the connections yet. to yeah, like the connections for OIDC won't use proxy, but connections to connect to the actual um source api like behind like bucket etc um oci repository that uses proxy just not getting the the connection for getting the token that 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 doesn't use a proxy if we are okay releasing it like that we should document it so we either right. ship the proxy we we modify the client so it knows how to use proxy for everything, including authentication. Mm -hmm. If we can't ship that, that we need to modify the documentation in source control and document there, hey, this is work, it is partially working. There is no support for proxying uh, OEDC auth calls, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's not a blocker if we document that, hey, this is not working. Cool, cool. But I anyway, I mean, have, sorry, go ahead. We have figured out everything. We just write, need to write it down and test. This yeah, yeah. Testing may take but I mean, I think I think I can I can get it out. But like, let's put it maybe if we don't have it by the end of next week, then we update the docs. Does that work? Mm -hmm. I have some more proxy discussions, but 
guess maybe you can do it. Well, the call I'm expecting hasn't oh, okay. <laughs> reached me, so okay. until it reaches me, I can stay here. So, since you're talking about proxy, uh, last week you told that maybe you'll say Flux has all proxy support. So I started looking into where do we need proxy or do we actually have proxy support every, everywhere in Flux? I found that in Helm repository or Helm chart, the classic one, we don't have proxy for object. I don't know why. Maybe because we are promoting OCI charts and we don't want to add anything in Helm repository. Stefan, any idea? Can you say it one more time? So in Helm repository, I'm... in source control yeah. Helm repository, the classic Helm repository, we don't have proxy support per object like we have for Git repository or OCI repository or even bucket. It should be added. I don't think there is a limitation on the Helm client itself because I believe we construct clients and do so many things with the client. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not for uh, uh, promoting Helm repository at all. For me, it's a done deal. Uh, no one should be using HTTPS, uh, HTTP Helm repos anymore. So I would not encourage. Uh, not spend maintainer's time on this stuff and focus on new features. I have uh, a question about this. Um, like, can we use uh, an OCI repository object as the source for a Helm chart? Yes. And it's like, it, we also can use a Helm repository object with an OCI URL. So they are basically the same thing, like the exact same thing. It's just two different no. ways of doing the same thing. No. No. Uh, the Helm repository OCI has many limitations while using OCI repository as the source of the Helm release does not have that, those limitations. Those limitations. So basically, if you use the Helm repository object for with oh, an OCI Helm repository object for your Helm chart object, that's worse than using an OCI repository object for a Helm chart object. Yeah, so the OCI repository support for Helm releases shipped in Flux 2.3 with Helm release 2.0, where if you read the blog post, we tell people. This is mm -hmm. the new way of how you should be mm -hmm. uh, working with uh, with OCI repos. Good to know. Uh, should I talk more about proxy? And it's Git, Git related. So Git repository already has proxy support. Similar to what we are talking about, we need reflector and OCI. The OIDC authentication in Git repository doesn't have proxy support. I believe. Git repo. Git repository proxy support. So Git repository API has proxy, but in terms yes. of Azure DevOps, Git authentication, we have not discussed about proxy. It's equivalent to what we just discussed in image reflector and OCI, the cloud contextual login. We should definitely support <laughs> proxy, right? <laughs> there are so many things to do, <laughs> consider. Yeah, of course we should. So I mean, that... if you, I don't know, an enterprise user of Azure, <laughs> some bank, right? If they have a proxy, Whatever are we doing now in OIDC authentication, it will not work because the VPC is closed. Only the, the proxy is the only way to access anything outside, right? This is, I don't know, some SOC security constraint that uh, usually enterprises have, right? Mm -hmm. we, we say to them, hey, you can use uh, uh, Azure OIDC. 
but without a proxy. Of course, they can't use it. I mean, the whole idea of supporting proxies is to support these use cases where the you are not allowed to exit the VPC without going through the proxy, which has audit enable, whatever does, man in the middle, all, all the stuff that a, uh, a proxy does. Right. So uh, this means <laughs> if the, you need to update the go get code, mm -hmm. the HTTP client uh, that obtains the token, check if they, like, I think they do accept uh, to pass a transport. Uh, I think we have similar code in the Azure blog code in source controller bucket. Mm -hmm. You can refer there how we pass proxy configuration to the transport to, I think it's called AZ core. It has some client options. So just pass it. Have a look at it, but it's been more things to think about. Okay. <laughs> Again, <laughs> uh... Is proxy support, uh, including proxy support, something that needs to be done <laughs> in this? <laughs> but is it GA API and I think it's required. <laughs> Anything we add in GA API, mm -hmm. we expect it to be kind of mature. <laughs> look, have a look at the bucket code. It should be simple. Okay. Yeah. I'll take a look. Uh, and I need to look like when we do Git cloning, are we passing the proxy transfer to the Git client? <laughs> I think we do need to verify. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, well, one more thing, or which is kind of large related to proxy. Other than these, uh, these controllers, uh, I looked at where else are we creating connections? from within Flux to outside that need to go through Proxy. Uh, I found that Notification Controller has so many providers and all of those go out, make outgoing connections from Notification Controller. And we have a lot of clients can support Proxy, but don't have Proxy support for some reason. I couldn't understand. Matthias added the Google Pub Sub client I looked at it, it looks like we can add proxy to that. <laughs> and the Azure Event Hub, looks like it, was, it can also have, a, it's just Azure SDK should be able to have proxy support. Azure DevOps client, maybe it, it can also support that. There's Sentry, Telegram, Arc, Metrics. These are using the common HTTP client, simple as you've had. There's no reason they can we don't have proxy. So if we say Flux has any person proxy support in some release, I think we need to cover all these areas. For sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's so many things. By okay. the way, we we have the like the there are code paths for verification, right? In OCI that we ah, are not cosine. Yeah, cosine and Notation, I think it's okay, right? Yeah. Okay. So cosine keyless, basically, right? We we should probably. I don't remember if I added something. Yeah, documented in the. Document about, in the you I did. You you probably requested that, I mean, right? <laughs> yeah. So I did. <laughs> cool. Um, cool. That that's all related. To, see, there is one big topic. Let me not be big. So can we still have time? <laughs> Maybe 10 minutes, huh? Yep. Okay. So I have expressed multiple times that the cache API, I, I, I don't like it. it. It appears to be complicated for even simple tasks. And initially when I was reviewing those changes, I tried to express those changes, but I felt there was a urgency to add this across different components, customization and other parts. So, and I felt like maybe I did not understand the, okay, uh, I did not understand the, the implementation well or the use case well. So I just reviewed the existing design, 
but suggested some improvements which are accepted. But now when I'm reviewing the Agile Ross part, I can I again see that there is, it's like we are just storing strings, the tokens, but the API is so weird. Why isn't it simple cache, set and get or uh, delete, and you pass the key and the value. But instead of that, we have to create some the store object, pass a function key, or the key function that extracts the key from the object. It's like for simple use case, why do we have such a complicated thing which may be just based on one use case where we store Kubernetes objects in the cache? So <laughs> yesterday I was playing with the cache, trying to understand how can I simplify this? There is a link, uh, I said. Yeah, can you share your screen opening the gist I have in cache API improvement ideas? Uh, it's is it in the draft I meeting notes? In Sorry. R2. Meeting notes, yeah, meeting notes. Uh, there's just one gist link, gist of GitHub account. Yeah. So I found that I made some changes trying to understand how can we simplify it. Problem is not generics. Problem is not the other thing. It's the, For the implementations, the uh, LRU cache and expirable cache, the implementations are good. I have no issue with those. But the interface that these implementations implement is overly complicated for even simple use cases. And I feel most of our cache usage will be simple, like string, where we'll be saving strings. Can you go to the top of the document? We can go through from there. Uh, I want to show the how what it requires when you want to use the cache. So under issues, uh, can you scroll down a bit? And that code that could zip it. So now this is how we have to write the code to store anything in the cache. We need to create a store object and then we set it. Then when you get when you want to get the object or the cache item, again you have to use the same object. You may be in a situation you you don't have the object, you just have the key, but still you need to create the object to call this get function. Similarly, the second concept is about delete. You want to delete something, you know the key that you want to delete. You have to create an object to delete the things. Okay, can you scroll down? So that, that, that's like one API issue. Yeah, you wrote about. Second is the interface, the store interface has so many things because it's uh, it's based on the client go interface. Here I explain that client go interface or the client go cache may be one use case where we need this style of all these methods, this interface. But most of our usage would be just get set delete. We will we may not need list keys in every cache usage. Resize, maybe we don't need it, and maybe it, resize is very implementation specific. It not be, need not be part of the interface itself. If you have the type uh, cache, just call directly that method of the cache. It may not be present in the interface. Can you scroll down more? And there are some more issues. I think that's because of using generics for the first time in flux here. So it's like we, we when you do get, in addition to returning the empty object, we also return a, an extra field called exists, which can be avoided. We can just return a pointer. If the pointer is nil, we know that it also doesn't exist. I tried it. I tried using a, a pointer star with T, the generic T. It works. We, we can return a generic pointer. It just works. So these are some improvements that, uh, that are some problems that I noticed and following is some improvements that I feel we can go towards. Can you scroll down more? So I here I described how we can simplify it. I feel we have, maybe, I think we have a use case for storing Kubernetes objects, but 
that is reflected on the store interface itself, which should not be the case. The store interface can be really simple, like the one it's shown here. Set has a string key and a value, which is a generic type, can be anything. Get has a key, a string key, which returns a pointer to a generic type. Delete just takes the key, string key, and deletes things. And if you have if you have this simple interface, can you scroll down a little bit more? The whole the set get delete becomes so simple. You don't need to create a separate object. And so my under so the extension of this would be for Kubernetes specific things, you build on top of the base simple cache, call it cube cache or whatever, which will operate on objects. So set accepts an object, a generic object, and here we'll extract the key from the object, and then internally we call the simple cache operation set get or whatever. And these two caches can be separate. The cube cache, the Kubernetes cache, can depend on the simple cache to do the actual operations internally, but it's just an API layer. Implementation is still in the core cache. And the core cache is independent of Kubernetes dependencies. It's really simple. So for storing tokens, we can use simple cache. For any use case where you could store Kubernetes objects, we use this cube cache or whatever you call it. And it can remain in maybe package runtime or something, which where it's it's normal to have Kubernetes dependencies. So it's it's like a wrapper. We have wrapper on the core cache to make it more Kubernetes friendly. This can be like a very close to client go cache. I think that's it. Stefan, yeah, sounds good. Yeah, I, huh? I like it. Uh, another another thing I was I was thinking about if we. If we don't strive to have persistence, mm -hmm. let's say we don't want to replace uh, bulk DB and so on, we can just get rid of this cache thing altogether and use what everybody uses in Go, which is this project from HashCorp. So bulk DB or image reflector was the use case for this? Uh, Kubernetes object type. Was that the use case or was it something else? No, uh, I don't know why Sule choose the interface, but. <laughs> I asked him, was there any discussion like many months ago? I think there was some discussion and I was not there. And he said he decided to base it on client go cache. And because we were in a hurry, I didn't say that's in the whole thing. Yeah. I mean, this. we, our use cases are strings, which are tokens with an expiry date, are large blobs mm -hmm. of JSON, which are Helm indexes, and are um, arrays of strings, which are tags. Tags, right. It's not Kubernetes object. No. So there is no use case for Kubernetes object. I don't know if any if there is any use case. Helm index has its own format. It's not Kubernetes object. No, it's just the JSON. Um... <laughs> okay. So the the pull request where this was introduced had a line about the informer cache, it's not clear what it's trying to express, but as far as I know, we never deal with informer cache. That's a detail in the control runtime there. We build on top of that. We never interact with that cache directly. So as, for, as far as I know, there's no use case. Okay. No. Think of any yeah, use no. case. No. OK, that simplifies it a lot. Uh, in that case, we can just have the simple cache I mentioned above. We don't even need good cache.
Yeah, we we don't need the implement. We don't need to implement the, that interface. I really need to okay. go. Uh... Okay, that's okay. It's Thirty minutes over. Okay. Okay. Uh, continue, Bye. please. Okay. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Oh. End the meeting.